Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm dead inside. And I'm Freddy. <laughs> Freddy Bo Bed. Ready. Freddy Bo Ready. Nice. Nice. Did that fuck you up? A little. Not as much as the first time. Yeah. Okay. Kind of feels like when you just like shake up a bottle of soda, you know, the, <laughs> the tension. Welcome back to another <laughs> eldest. <laughs> Somebody leave me in the comment section below what the hell she's talking <laughs> about. <laughs> it's like you're a robot and you don't know what feelings feel like. The last time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aragon met a pretty girl and he wanted to have her touch his pee. He wanted to summon spirits with her. <laughs> And then Safira bursted in and said, get out of here. And she's on top of me. And it was <laughs> hot, hot, hot. What? <laughs> the song. The like, it's on TikTok. I don't watch and TikTok. And she's on top of me. And it was hot, hot, hot. And then she said, like, take it off. And so I took it off. And then her dad walks in. <laughs> Ew. But instead it's Safira. Oh, my God. Safira walks in. And then called her a slut. And then literally called her slatin slattern. Yeah. And which then means slut. Then they walked around. Aragon avoided people. No nah, Zawada said, Go train with the elves. We're moving to Serta. K okay, bye. <clears throat> and then Aragon saw Angela. Angela said, I'm collecting mushrooms. <laughs> Wow, when we read back to back, your recaps are fucking on point. <laughs> wow, well, who'd have known? Um, and then she winked at him and disappeared. <laughs> In the thin <laughs> air. And then that's it. Nice. Fucking excellent recap, dude. I've never <laughs> heard a better one. That's unfortunate. It is. <clears throat> Ready? Ready, Freddy. Shut the fuck up. Stop I saying that. It's stop. so annoying. You really think it's annoying? No. It's just, it's not my name. <laughs> it's not my name. They call me hell. They call me Freddy. That's not my name. Not my name. Chapter 10. Hrothgar's Gift. Uh-oh. What do you think it could be? Oh, fuck. Oh, God. God damn do it. Do thing. Yeah, it fucking got all loosey goosey. Um, maybe his gift is a a rock. <laughs> nice. <laughs> a rock chiseled into the likeness of Rothgar. <laughs> or is it our Mithrum? <clears throat> Dawn was a half hour away when Aragon and Sephira arrived at Tronchim's north gate. Oh, they're a half hour early. Nice. Nice. Not me. <laughs> the, ga the gate was raised just enough to let Safira pass so they hurried underneath it then waited in the recessed area beyond where red jasper pillars loomed above and carved beasts snarled between the bloody piers past the they have a lot of different rocks and like minerals and shit here and I just want to know if that's even realistic for mountainous volcanic areas continue maybe they bring it in Maybe they mine it out. Past those, at the very edge of Tronchim, sat two 30-foot-high gold griffins. Identical pairs guarded each of the city mountain's gates. No one was in sight. Aragon held Snowfire's reins. The stallion was brushed, reshod, and saddled, his saddlebags bulging with goods. He pawed the floor impatiently. Aragon had not ridden him for over a week. Before long, Oric ambled up, bearing a large pack on his back and a bundle in his arms. <clears throat> No horse? asked Aragon, somewhat surprised. Are we supposed to walk all the way to do Weldon Varden? Don't be such a spoiled brat, Aragon. He didn't say that out loud. Oh. He said that in his mind. Okay. <laughs> uh or grunted. <clears throat> we'll be stopping at her <laughs> like my dad grunts. <sighs> <laughs> Or grunted. We'll be stopping at Tarnag. We'll be stopping at Tarnag, just north of here. <laughs> From there, we take rafts along the Azragni to Hedarth, then out 
an outpost for trading with the elves. We don't, we won't need steeds before head art, so I'll use my own feet till then. He set the bundle down with a clang, then unwrapped it, revealing Aragon's armor. The shield had been repainted, so the oak tree stood clearly in the center, and all the dings and scrapes removed. Beneath it was a long male shirt, burnished and oiled until the steel gleamed brilliantly. No sign existed of where it had been rent when Durza cut Aragon's back. The coif, gloves, bracers, greaves, and helmet were likewise repaired. Our greatest smiths worked on these, said Oric, as well as your armor, Saphira. However, since we can't take dragon armor with us, it was given to the Varden, who will guard it against our return. Please thank him for me, said Saphira. Aragon obliged, then laced on the greaves and braces, storing the other items in his bags. Last of all, he reached for his helm, only to find Oric holding it. The dwarf rolled the piece between his hands and said, Don't be so quick to don this, Aragon. There is a choice you must make first. What choice is that? Raising the helmet, Oric uncovered its polished brow, which Aragon now saw had been altered. Etched in the steel were the hammer and stars of Hrothgar and Oric's clan, the Ingetum. Oric scowled, looking both pleased and troubled, and said in a formal voice, Mine king Hrothgar desires that I present this helm as a symbol of the friendship he bears for you, and with it, Hrothgar extends an offer to adopt you as one of Durgetst and Getum, as a member of his own family. Whoa, that's quite the gift. Aragon stared at the helm, amazed that Hrothgar would make such a gesture. Does this mean I'd be subjected to his rule? If I continue to occur loyalties and allegiances, allegiances at this pace, I'll be incapacitated before long, <laughs> unable to do anything without breaking some oath. You don't have to put it on, pointed out Saphira. And risk insulting Hrothgar? Once again, we're trapped. It may be intended as a gift, though, another sign of Otho, not a trap. I would guess he's thanking us for my offer to repair Isidar Mithrim. That had not occurred to Aragon, for he had been too busy trying to figure out how the Dwarf King might gain advantage over them. True, but I think it's also an attempt to correct the imbalance of power I created when I swore fealty to Naswada. The dwarves couldn't have been pleased with that turn of events. He looked back at Orc who was waiting anxiously. How often has this been done? For a human? Never. Hrothgar argued with the Ingetum families for days and a night before they agreed to accept you. If you consent to bear our crest, you will have full rights as clan member. You may attend our councils and give voice on every issue, and, he grew very somber, if you so wish, you will have the right to be buried with our dead. Whoa. For the first time, the enormity of Hrothgar's action struck Aragon. The dwarves could offer no higher honor. With a swift motion, he took the helm from Oric and pressed it down upon his head. I am privileged to join Der Grimst in Getum. Oric nodded with approval and said, Then take this Nurl Nine, the heart of stone, and cup it between your hands. Yes, like so. You must steal yourself now and prick open a vein to wet the stone. A few drops will suffice. To finish, repeat after me. Os Ildom. Kuran nu karn du thargen zitmen oin grimst for fromf idaris rak skilf narho is belgond. It was a lengthy recitation, and all the longer because Oric stopped to translate every few sentences. Afterward, Aragon healed his rest, wrist with a quick spell. Um, I'm sorry. Did they just perform some sort of blood oath, blood magic, something? Blood ritual. Like maybe. Um, that's a little much. I think. Now he's a part of Der Gimst in Getum. What he said was, Let our flesh honor and hall be made as one by this blood of mine, I do pledge. Whatever else the clans may say about this business, observed Oric, you have behaved with integrity and respect. They cannot ignore that, he grinned. We are the same clan now, eh? You are my foster brother. Under more normal circumstances, Hrothgar would have presented your helm himself and he would have held a lengthy ceremony to commemorate your indu induction into Der G it's going to kill me saying this anymore. Der Grimst in Getum. <laughs> but events move too swiftly for us to tarry. Fear not that you are being slighted, though. Your adoption shall be celebrated with the proper rituals when you and Saphir next return to Farthendur. You shall feast and dance and have many pieces of paper to sign in order to formalize your new position. I look forward to the day, said Aragon. He was still preoccupied with sifting through the numerous possibility, possible ramifications of belonging to Der Grimst in Getum. Marky. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I 
because I know someone had like brought this up in a comment how I was like, ooh, why did they say Roran walked up the hill when the chapter's called Roran? And like I was <laughs> okay, listen. Um, <laughs> which like it their comment made sense. Like how really hope this is connected. Like it made sense because like being vague sometimes is like frustrating. And so like I understand like he wants to remain as clear as possible, Christopher Paolini does. But sometimes I'm like, damn dude, like can you you're not you don't I mean <clears throat> Yeah, because it's a lot of time your induction into the clan. Yeah. Could have been said. Mm-hmm. And I would have I would have been tracking along just well. I mean, like what other fucking clan do we know of? Name one other um dwarf clan. Right. Like we don't know. And then also we're specifically Could have said mine clan too, to yeah. make it like extra dwarfish. Yeah. Whatever. I don't know. That's frustrating for me. Sitting against a pillar, Orc shrugged off his pack and drew his axe, which he proceeded to twirl between his palms. After several minutes, he leaned forward, glaring back into Tronchim. Barzul, Norlar, where are they? Arya said she would be right here. Ha! El's only concept of time is late and even later. Same. <laughs> Have you dealt with them much? Asked Aragon, crouching. Sephira watched with interest. The dwarf laughed suddenly. Etta. Only Arya. And then sporadically, because she traveled so often, in seven decades, I've learned one thing about her. You can't rush an elf. Trying is like hammering a file. It might break, but it will never bend. Aren't doors the same? Ah, but stone will shift, given enough time, Oryx sighed and shook his head. Of all the races, elves change the least, which is one reason I'm reluctant to go. But we'll get to meet Queen Islanzadi and see Elis Mira, and who else knows what else? That was weird. (laughs) (laughs) And who knows what else? When was the last time a dwarf was invited into do Weldon Varden? Oric frowned at him. Scenery means nothing. Scenery means nothing. Urgent tasks remain in Tronchim and our other cities. Yet I must tramp across Elegazia to exchange pleasantries and sit and grow fat as you are tutored. It could take years. Years. Still, if that's what is required to defeat Shades and the Rassak, I'll do it. I don't know if you noticed, but I try to read softer when it's mind talk going on. Oh, okay. Has it been translating that way? No. <laughs> Shit. Like, not as much, because I don't think I was, like, being cognizant of you. Making, I mean, now I'll know. Like, for the most part, whenever I read Safira's voice, it's kind of like this. Because mm-hmm. I'm trying to do, like, a soft, like, mind talky. So, whenever I read Aragon's voice, I try to read it, like, years. Still, that's what's required to defeat the Shade. Then the Razak, I'll do it. Actually, maybe it has been. I just haven't been, like, conscious of it. Safira touched... That's good, then. Safira touched his mind. I doubt Nasawada will let us stay in Elismira for more than a few months. With what she told us, we'll be needed fairly soon. At last, said Oric, pushing himself upright. Approaching were Nasawada, slippers flashing beneath her dress, like mice darting from a hole. Jormunder and Arya, who bore a pack like Oryx. She wore the same black leather outfit Aragon had seen had first seen her in, as well as her sword. At that moment, it struck Aragon that Arya and Nasawada might not approve of him joining the Ingetum. Oops. Whoops. Not like late. he swore fealty to anybody that he would need approval before he made a decision. Um, yeah. Also, couldn't he have just said Nasawada was wearing a long dress? Yeah. Guilt and trepidation <laughs> shot through him as he realized that it has been his duty to consult Nasawada first, and Arya. He cringed. Remembering how angry she had been after he, his first meeting with the Council of Elders. Oof. Thus, when Nasawada stopped before him, he, aver- sh- he averted his eyes, ashamed. But she only said, you accepted. Her voice was gentle, restrained. He nodded, still looking down. I wondered if you would. Now, once again, all three races have a hold on you. The dwarves can claim your allegiance as a member of Der, Der Grimst and Getum. The elves will train and shape you, and their influence may be the strongest, for you and Sephira are bound by their magic, and you have sworn fealty to me, a human. Perhaps it is best that we share your loyalty. She met his surprise with an odd smile, then pressed a small bag of coins into his palm and stepped away. Oh no. Is something going to happen where like all three of them have like ties, and then like they're all going to get mad at each other, and they're going to try to like <clears throat> pull him in like three different ways? And then a war breaks out between the three races. Oh my god, that'd be fucking so unexpected. Jormunder extended a hand, which Aragon shook, feeling a bit dazed. Have a good trip, Aragon. Guide yourself well. 
Come, said Arya, gliding past them into the darkness of Arthendur. It is time to leave. Aedil has set, and we have far to go. I agreed Oric. He pulled out a red lantern from the side of his pack. Naswada looked them over once more. Very well, Aragon and Saphira. You have the Varden's blessing as well as mine. May your journey be safe. Remember, you carry the weight of our hopes and expectations, so acquit yourselves honorably. We will do our best, promised Aragon. Gripping Snowfire's reins firmly, he started after Arya, who was already several yards away. Oric followed, then Saphira. As Saphira passed Naswada, Aragon saw her pause and lightly licked Naswada on her cheek. Then she lengthened her stride, catching up with him. As they continued north along the road, the gate behind them shrank smaller and smaller until it was reduced to a pinprick of light, with two lonely silhouettes were Nasawada and Dromunder remaining watching. When they finally reached Farthendor's base, they found a pair of gigantic doors, thirty feet tall, open and waiting. Three dwarf guards bowed and moved away from the aperture. Through the doors was a tunnel of matching proportions lined with columns and lanterns for the first fifty feet. After that it was empty. Or, after that, it was as empty and silent as a mausoleum. It looked exactly like Farthendor's western entrance, but Aragon knew that this tunnel was different. Instead of burrowing through the mile-thick base to emerge outside, it proceeded underneath mountain after mountain, all the way to the dwarf city Tarnag. Here is our path, said Oric, lifting the lantern. He and Arya crossed over the threshold, but Aragon held back, suddenly uncertain. While he did not fear the dark, neither did he welcome being surrounded by eternal night until they arrived at Tarnag, and once he entered the barren tunnel, he would again be hurling himself into the unknown, abandoning the few things he had grown accustomed to among the Vardon, in exchange for an uncertain destiny. What is it? asked Saphira. Nothing. He took a breath, then mm -hmm. strode forward, allowing the mountain to swallow him in its depths. Ooh. How very foreboding. You know, because, like, presumably they don't keep this tunnel lit, so they have to have a lantern. Yep. So, like, that's spooky. Also, I kind of hope we just touch up a little bit on their journey and then we just kind of end up. We do. Hell yeah. Don't worry. It's not like a one page description of darkness. God, I mean, <laughs> just a challenge for Christopher. How many different ways can I describe darkness? I think if I remember correctly, it's kind of weird when we like catch back up with them because like. Aragon like asks questions or something but it's like questions that he probably would have asked while they were traveling so it kind of sounds like they just didn't talk at all while they were traveling I don't know I don't really remember it that well hmm. chapter 11 okay these dots indicate that we're done with Aragon's part and we're on to somebody else's cool chapter 11 hammer and tongs three days after the Razak's arrival Roran found himself pacing uncontrollably along the edge of his camp in the spine he had heard nothing since Albrecht's visit, nor was it possible to glean information by observing Carvajal. He glared at the distant tents where the soldiers slept, then continued pacing. At midday, Roran had a small, dry lunch. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he wondered, how long are the Razak willing to wait? If it was a test of patience, he was determined to win. To pass the time, he practiced his archery on a rotting log, stopping only when an arrow shattered on a rock embedded in the trunk. <clears throat> After that, nothing else remained to do except to resume striding back and forth along the bare track that stretched from a boulder to where he slept. He was still pacing when footsteps sounded in the forest below. Grabbing his bow, Roran hid and waited. Relief rushed through him when Baldor's face bobbed into view. Roran waved him over. As they sat, Roran asked, Why hasn't anyone come? We couldn't, said Baldor, wiping sweat off his brow. The soldiers have been watching us too closely. This was the first opportunity we had to get away. I can't stay long, either. He turned his face toward the peak above them and shuddered. You're braver than I, staying here. Have you had any trouble with wolves, bears, mountain cats? Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. <laughs> no, no. No and no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm fine. Did the soldiers say anything new? One of them bragged to Morn last night that their squad was handpicked for this mission. Roran frowned. They haven't been too quiet. At least two or three of them get drunk each night. A group of them tore up Morn's common room the first day. Did they pay for the damage? Of course not. Roran shifted, staring down at the village. I still have trouble believing that the Empire would go to, to these lengths to capture me. What could I give them? What do they think I can give them? Baldur followed his gaze. The Razak questioned Katrina today. Someone mentioned that the two of you are close, and the Razak were curious if she knew where you'd gone. Roran refocused on Baldor's open face. Is she all right? 
It would take more than those two to scare her, reassured Baldor. His next sentence was cautious and probing. Perhaps you should consider turning yourself in. I'd sooner hang myself and them with me, Roran started up and stalked over his usual route, still tapping his leg. How can you say that, knowing how they tortured my father? Catching his arm, Baldor said, What happens if you remain in hiding and the soldiers don't give up and leave? They'll assume we lied to help you escape. The Empire doesn't forgive traitors. Roran shrugged off Baldor. He spun around, tapping his leg, then abruptly sat. If I don't show myself, the Razak will blame the people at hand. If I attempt to lead the Razak away... Roran was not a skilled enough woodsman to evade 30 men and the Razak. Aragon could do it, but not me. Aragon could do it. Still, unless the situation changed, it might be the only choice available to him. He looked at Baldor. I don't want anyone to be hurt on my behalf. I'll wait for now. And if the Razak grow impatient and threaten someone, well then, I'll think of something else to do. It's a nasty situation all around, offered Baldor. One I intend to survive. Baldor departed soon afterward, leaving Roran alone with his thoughts on the on his endless path. He covered mile after mile, grinding a rut into the earth under the weight of his ruminations. When chill dusk arrived, he removed his boots for wear, or for fear of wearing them out, and proceeded to pad barefoot. Just as a waxing moon rose and subsumed, subsumed the night shadows and beams of marble light, Rora noticed a disturbance in Carvajal. Scores of lanterns bobbed through the dark village, darkened village, winking in and out as they floated behind houses. The yellow specks clustered in the center of Carvajal like a cloud of fireflies, then streamed haphazardly toward the edge of town, where they were met by a hard line of torches from the soldiers' camp. For two hours, Roran watched. The opposing sides faced each other, the agitated lanterns milling helplessly against the stolen torches. Finally, the lambent groups dispersed and filtered back into the tents and houses. When nothing else of interest occurred, Roran untied his bedroll and slipped under the blankets. Throughout the next day, Carvajal was consumed with unusual activities. Activity. Figures strode between houses, and even, Roran was surprised to see, rode out into Palancar Valley toward various farms. At noon, he saw two men enter the soldiers' camp and disappear into the Razak's tent for almost an hour. So involved was he with the proceedings, Roran barely moved the entire day. He was in the middle of dinner when, as he had hoped, Baldor reappeared. Hungry? asked Roran, gesturing. Baldor shook his head and sat with an air of ex exhaustion. Dark lines under his eyes made his skin look thin and bruised. Quimby's dead. Roran's bowl clattered as it struck the ground. He cursed, wiping cold stew off his leg, then asked, How? A couple of soldiers started bothering Tara last night. Tara was Morn's wife. She didn't really mind, except the men got in a fight over who she was supposed to serve next. Quimby was there. Checking a cask Morn said had turned, and he tried to break them up. Roran nodded. That was Quimby, always interfering to make sure others behaved properly. Only thing is, a soldier threw a pitcher and hit him on the temple, killed him instantly. Roran stared at the ground with his hands on his hips, struggling to regain control over his ragged breathing. He felt as if Baldor had knocked the wind out of him. It doesn't seem possible. Quimby gone? The farmer and part-time brewer was as much as part of the landscape as the mountain surrounding Carvajal an unquestioned presence that shaped the fabric of the village. Will the men be punished? The question, actually. Was he seriously asking if the Empire men will be punished because they won't? That fun person's voice I did that was using the horse was Ivar. I thought that was Quimby for a oh, second. Me too. <clears throat> so he's not dead, at least. At least I can pocket that fun voice for later. <laughs> will the men be punished? Baldor held up his hand. Right after Quimby died, the Razak stole his body from the tavern and hauled it out to their tents. We tried to get it back last night, but they wouldn't talk with us. I saw. Baldor grunted, rubbing his face. Dad and Loring met with the Razak today and managed to convince them to release the body. The soldiers, however, won't face any consequences. He paused. I was about to leave when Quimby was handed over. You know what his wife got? Bones. Bones? Every one of them was nibbled clean. You could see the bite marks, and most had been cracked open for the marrow. Disgust gripped Roran, as well as profound horror for Quimby's fate. It was well known that a person's spirit could never rest until his body was given a proper burial. Revolted by the desecration, he asked, What? Who ate them? The soldiers were just as appalled. It must have been the Razak. Why? 
To what end? I don't think, said Baldor, that the Razak are human. You've never seen them up close, but their breath is foul, and they always cover their faces with black scarves. Their backs are humped and twisted, and they speak they speak to each other and they speak to each other with clicks. Even their men seem to fear them. If they aren't human, then what kind of creatures can they be? demanded Roran. They're not Urgles. Who knows? Fear now joined Roran's revulsion. Fear of the supernatural. He saw it echoed on Baldor's face as a young man clasped his hands. For all the stories of Agalbatoric's misdeeds, <laughs> it was still a shock to have the king's evil roosted among their homes. A sense of history settled on Rorn as he realized he was involved with forces he had previously been acquainted with only through songs and stories. Something should be done, he muttered. It's kind of weird that they live in a world with literal magic and he has a fear of the supernatural. Which, like, I guess I understand, like, supernatural is just, like, uh... I don't know, more than what is just like naturally occurring, like magical typically, but yeah. But also like even in their world of supernatural, how long has King Galbatorix been on his throne? Yeah. <clears throat> He's eradicated all the other writers. The elves are in Duald and Varden. It's not like they're out mingling amongst with the normal common folk. That's true. So everybody is magic less. There's not really supernatural forces running about. And I guess it throughout is throughout Roran's entire life and his father's entire life and probably even his father's entire life. Yeah, and it is kind of horrifying that like somebody that you knew <clears throat> was eaten and their bones were picked clean. Like, and that's kind of gross. The and most freaks me out. Beast that anybody's ever encountered is an Urgle. Yeah. And they can't use magic. That's true. So I guess I'm thinking of it as like a mere human in this universe's like mindset, you know, of like, oh, Urgle, that's like a crazy thing. Not like, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Kind of. (laughs) (laughs) The air grew warmer throughout the night until by afternoon, Palancar Valley shimmered and sweltered with the unexpected spring heat. Carvalho looked peaceful under the bald blue sky, yet Roran could feel the sour resentment that clenched its inhabitants with malicious intensity. The calm was like a sheet stretched taut in the wind. Despite the aura of expectation, the day proved to be utterly boring. Roran spent most of his time brushing horse mare. At last, he lay to sleep, looking up past the towering pines at the haze of stars that adorned the night sky. They seemed so close. It felt as if he hurtled among them, falling toward the blackest void. The moon was setting when Roran woke, his throat raw from smoke. He coughed and rolled upright, blinking, his eyes burned and watered, or blinking as his eyes burned and watered. The noxious fumes made it difficult to breathe. Roran grabbed his blankets and saddled the frightened mare, then spurred her farther up the mountain, hoping to find clear air. It quickly became apparent that the smoke was ascending with him, so he turned and cut sideways through the forest. After several minutes spent maneuvering in the dark, they finally broke free and rode onto a ledge swept clean by a breeze. Purging his lungs with long breaths, Roran scanned the valley for the fire. He spotted it in an instant. Carvajal's hay barn glowed white in a cyclone of flames, transforming its precious contents into a fountain of amber motes. Roran trembled as he watched the destruction of the town's feed. He wanted to scream and run through the forest to help with the bucket brigade, Yet, he could not force himself to abandon his own safety. Now, a molten spark landed on Delwyn's house. Within seconds, the thatched roof exploded in a wave of fire. Roran cursed and tore his hair, tears streaming down his face. This was why mishandling fire was a hanging offense in Carvajal. Was it an accident? Was it the soldiers? Are the Razak punishing the villagers for shielding me? Am I somehow responsible for this? Fisk's house joined the conflagration next. Aghast. Warren could only avert his face, hating himself for his cowardice. Oh my god. By dawn, all the fires had been extinguished or burned out on their own. Only sheer luck and a calm night saved the rest of Carvajal from being consumed. Roran waited until he was sure of the outcome, then retreated to his old camp and threw himself down to rest. From morning through or from morning through evening, he was oblivious to the world except through the lens of his troubled dreams. Upon his return to awareness, Roran simply waited for the visitor he would sure or he was sure would appear. This time it was Alberic. He arrived at dusk with a grim, worn expression. 
Come with me, he said. Roar intensed. Why? Have they decided to give me up? If he was the cause of the fire, he would understand the villagers wanting him gone. He might even agree it was necessary. It was unreasonable to expect everyone in Carvel Hall to sacrifice themselves for him. Still, the de- that did not mean he would allow them just to hand him over to the Razak after what the two monsters had done to Quimby. Roran would fight to the death to avoid being their prisoner. Because, said Albrecht, clenching his jaw muscles, it was the soldiers who started the fire. Morn banned them from the seven chiefs, but they still got drunk on their own beer. One of them dropped a torch against the hay barn on his way to bed. Was anyone hurt? asked Roran. A few burns. Gertrude was able to handle them. We tried to negotiate with the Razak. They spat on our request that the Empire or they spat on our request that the Empire replace our losses and the guilty faced justice. They even refused to confine the soldiers to their tents. So why should I return? Albrecht chuckled hollowly. For hammer and tongs, we need your help to remove the Razak. You would do that for me? We're not risking ourselves for your sake alone. This concerns the entire village now. At least come talk to Father and the others and hear their thoughts. I think you would be glad to get out of these cursed mountains. Roran considered Albrecht's proposition long and hard before deciding to accompany him. It's this or run for it, and I I can always run later. He fetched the mare, tied his bags to the saddle, then followed Albrecht toward the valley floor. The progress slowed as they neared Carvajal, using trees and brush for cover. Slipping behind a rain barrel, Albrecht checked to see if the streets were clear, then signaled to Roran. Together they crept from shadow to shade, constantly on guard from the Empire servants, or for the Empire servants. At Horse Forge, Albrecht opened one of the double doors just far enough for Roran and the mare to quietly enter. Inside the workshop was lit by a single candle, which cast a trembling glow over the rings of faces that hovered about it in the surrounding darkness. Horst was there, his thick beard protruded like a shelf into the light, flanked by the hard visages of Delwyn, Gedrick, and then Loring. The rest of the group was composed of younger men, Baldor, Loring's three sons, Parr, and Quimby's boy, Nolforvel, who was only thirteen. They all turned to look as Roran entered the assembly. Horace said, Ah, you made it. You escaped misfortune while in the spine. I was lucky. Then we can proceed. With what exactly? Roran hitched the mare to an anvil as he spoke. Loring answered, The shoemaker's parchment face a mass of contorting lines and grooves. Like, uh... I'd imagine Gordon Ramsay's. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> We attempted to reason with these Razak, these invaders, these donkeys. (laughs) He stopped, his thin frame racked with an unpleasant metallic wheeze deep in his chest. (laughs) Oh my God. They have refused reason. They have endangered us all with no sign of remorse or contrition. He made a noise in his throat and said with pronounced deliberation, they must go, such creatures. No, said Roran, not creatures desecrators. The faces scowled and bobbed in agreement. Delwyn picked up the thread of conversation. The point is, it's everyone's life at stake. If that fire had spread any farther, dozens of people would have been killed, and those who escaped would have lost everything they own. As a result, we've agreed to drive the Razak away from Carvajal. Will you join us? Roran hesitated. What if they returned? (sighs) The fuck? What if they return or send for reinforcements? We can't defeat the entire empire. No, said Horst, grave and solemn, but neither can we stand silent and allow the soldiers to kill us and to destroy our property. A man can endure only so much abuse before he must strike back. Loring laughed, throwing back his head so the flame gilded the stumps of his teeth. First we fortify, he whispered with glee, then we fight. We'll make them regret they ever clapped their festering eyes on Carvajal. Ha ha ha! Ooh, excuse me. Um, I'm scared that the whole place is gonna, but I don't know, to be destroyed. I think we could do one more. One more? Yeah. Okay. I think we have time. Chapter 12, Retaliation. After Roran agreed to their plan, Horst began distributing shovels, pitchforks, flails, anything that could be used to beat the soldiers and the Razak away. Roran hefted a pick, then set it aside. Though he had never cared for Brahm's stories, one of them, the Song of Gurand, resonated with him whenever he heard it. 
It told of Garand, the greatest warrior of his time, who relinquished his sword for a wife and farm. He found no peace, however, as a jealous lord initiated a blood feud against Garand's family, which forced Garand to kill once more. Yet, he did not fight with his blade, but with a simple hammer. Going to the wall, Roran removed a medium-sized hammer with a long handle and a rounded blade on one side of the head. <clears throat> he tossed it from hand to hand, and then went to Horst and asked, May I have this? Horst eyed the tool and Roran. Use it wisely. Then he said to the rest of the group, Listen, we want to scare, not kill. Break a few bones if you want, but don't get carried away. And whatever you do, don't stand and fight. No matter how brave or heroic you feel, remember that they are trained soldiers. When everyone was equipped, they left the forge and wound their way through Carvajal to the edge of Raz the Razak's camp. The soldiers had already gone to bed except for four sentries who patrolled the perimeter of the gray tents. The Razak's two horses were picketed by a smoldering fire. Horse quietly issued orders sending Albrecht and Delwyn to ambush two of the sentries and Parr and Roran to ambush the other two. Roran held his breath as he stalked the oblivious soldier. His heart began to shudder as energy spiked through his limbs. He hid behind the corner of a house, quivering, and waited for Horse signal. Wait. Wait. With a roar, Horst burst from hiding, leading the charge onto the tents. Roran darted forward and swung his hammer, catching the sentry on the shoulder with a grisly crunch. The man howled and dropped his halberd. He staggered as Roran struck his ribs and back. Roran raised the hammer again and the man retreated, screaming for help. Roran ran after him, shouting incoherently. He knocked in the side of a wool tent, trampling whatever was inside, then smashed the top of a helmet he saw emerging from another tent. The metal rang like a bell. Roran barely noticed as Loring danced past. The old man cackled and hooted in the night as he jabbed the soldiers with a pitchfork. Oh my god. Everywhere was a confusion of struggling bodies. Rolling around, Roran saw a soldier attempting to string his bow. He rushed forward and hit the back of the bow with a steel mallet, breaking the wood in two. The soldier fled. The Razak scrambled free of their tent with horrible screeches. <laughs> swords in hand. Before they could attack, Baldor untethered the horses and sent them galloping toward the two scarecrow figures. The Razak separated, then regrouped, only to be swept away as the soldiers' morale broke, and they ran. Then it was over. Roran panted in the silence. His hand cramped around the hammer's handle. After a moment, he picked his way through the crumpled mounds of tents and blankets to Horst. The smith was grinning under his beard. That's a breast ball. <laughs> That's the best brawl I've had in years. Behind them, Carvajal jumped to life as people tried to discover the source of the commotion. Roran watched lamps flare up behind shuttered windows, then turned as he heard soft sobbing. The boy, Nofavrel, was kneeling by the body of a soldier, methodically stabbing him in the chest as tears slid down his chin. Gedrick and Albrecht hurried over and pulled Nulferville away from the corpse. He shouldn't have come, said Roran. Horse shrugged. It was his right. All the same. Uh, I mean, he's like 13, though. Maybe... And he's killed a man now. Yeah, and then he was, like, crying and just, like, couldn't stop stabbing that guy. Like, he's fucked up for life now. Yeah. Way to go, Horst. All the same, killing one of the Razak's men would only make it harder to rid ourselves of the desecrators. We should barricade the road and between the houses so they won't catch us by surprise. Studying the men for any er injuries, Roran saw that Delwyn had received a long cut on his forearm, which the farmer bandaged with a strip of, with a strip torn from his ruined shirt. With a few hours, Horst organized their group. He dispatched Albrecht and Baldur to retrieve Quimby's wagon from the forge and had Loring's sons and Parr scour Carvajal for items that could be used to secure the village. Even as he spoke, people congregated on the edge of the field, staring at what was left of the Razak's camp and the dead soldier. What happened? cried Fisk. Loring scuttled forward and stared at the carpenter in the eye. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. We routed the dung beardlings, caught them with their boots off, and whipped them like dogs. I am glad. The strong voice came from Burgett, an auburn-haired woman, who clasped Noforvel against her bosom, ignoring the blood smeared across his face. They deserve to die like cowards for my husband's death. The villagers murmured in agreement, but then Thane spoke. Have you gone mad, Horst? Have you... Even if you frightened off the Razak and their soldiers, Galbatorix will just send more men. The Empire will never give up until they get Roran. We should hand him over, snarled Sloane. Horus raised his hands. I agree. 
No one is worth more than all of Carvajal, but if we surrender Roran, do you really think Galbertorix will let us escape punishment for our resistance? In his eyes, we're no better than the Varden. Then why did you attack? demanded Thane. Who gave you the authority to make, the dis make this decision? You've doomed us all. This time, Burgett answered. Would you let them kill your wife? She pressed her hands on either side of her son's face, then showed Thane her bloody palms like an accusation. Would you let them burn us? Where is your manhood? Manhood. <laughs> what are you doing in these woods? Where is your manhood, lone breaker? He lowered his gaze, unable to face her stark expression. They burned my farm, said Rorn, devoured Quimby, and nearly destroyed Carvajal. Such crimes cannot go unpunished. Are we frightened rabbits to cower down and accept our fate? No, we have a right to defend ourselves. He stopped as Albrick and Baldor trudged up the street, dragging the wagon. We can debate later. Now we have to prepare. We can debate later. Now we have to prepare. Who will help us? Forty or more men volunteered. Together they set about the difficult task of making Carvajal impenetrable. Roran worked incessantly, nailing fence slats between houses, piling barrels full of rocks for makeshift walls, and dragging logs across a main road, which they blocked with two wagons tipped on their sides. As Roran hurried from one chore to another, Katrina waylaid him in an alley. She hugged him, then said, I'm glad you're back and that you're safe. He kissed her lightly. Katrina, I have to speak with you as soon as we're f I have to speak with you as soon as we're finished. She smiled uncertainly, but with a spark of hope. You're right. It was foolish of me to delay. Every moment we spend together is precious, and I have no desire to squander what time we have when a whim of fate could tear us apart. Warren was tossing water on the thatching of Kisselt's house so it could not catch fire when Parr shouted, Razak! <laughs> what? It's just very dramatic. I mean, I guess this whole thing is very dramatic, but... Yeah, dude. It was, like, comically dramatic. <clears throat> Dropping the bucket, Roran ran to the wagons where he had left his hammer. As he grabbed the weapon, he saw a single Razak sitting on a horse far down the road, almost out of bowshot. The creature was illuminated by a torch in his left hand while its right was drawn back as if to throw something Roran laughed <laughs> <laughs> is he going to toss rocks at us he's too far away to even hit he was cut off as a Razak whipped down its arm and a glass vial arched across the distance between them and shattered against a wagon to his right an instant later a fireball launched the wagon into the air while a fist of burning air flung Roran against a wall that's a fucking grenade, wasn't it? It was like a magic grenade. But it was a grenade. It was like <laughs> alchemy or something, I'm guessing. Dazed, he fell to his hands and knees, gasping for breath. Through the roaring in his ears came the tattoo of galloping horses. He forced himself upright and faced the sound, only to dive aside as the Razak raced into Carvajal through the burning gap in the wagons. The Razak reined in their steeds, blades flashing as they hacked at the people strewn around them. Roran saw three men die. Then Horst and Loring reached the Razak and began pressing them back with pitchforks. Before the villagers could rally, soldiers poured through the breach, killing indiscriminately in the darkness. Roran knew they had to be stopped, else Carvajal would be taken. He jumped at a soldier, catching him by surprise, and hit him in the face with the hammer's blade. The soldier crumpled without a sound. As a man's compatriots rushed toward him, Roran wrestled the corpse shield off his limp arm. He barely managed to get it free in time to block the first strike. Backstepping toward the Razak, Roran parried a sword thrust, then swung his hammer up under the man's chin, sending him to the ground. To me, shouted Roran, defend your homes! He sidestepped a jab as five men attempted to encircle him. To me! Baldor answered his call first, then Albrick. A few seconds later, Loring sung... A few seconds later, Loring's sons joined him, followed by a score of others. From the side streets, women and children pelted the soldiers with rocks. Stay together, ordered Roran, standing his ground. There are more of us. The soldiers halted as a line of villagers before them continued to thicken. With more than a hundred men at his back, Roran slowly advanced. Attack, you fools, screamed Arazak, dodging Loring's pitchfork. It does actually have multiple S's. Nice. For me to go. A single arrow whizzed toward Roran. He caught it on his shield and laughed. The Razak were level with the soldiers now, hissing with frustration. They glared at the villagers from under their inky cowls. Suddenly, Roran felt himself become lethargic and powerless to move. It was hard to even think. 
Fatigue seemed to chain his arms and legs in place. Then, from farther in Carvajal, Roran heard a raw shout from Burgett. A second later, a rock hurled over his head and bore toward the lead Razak, who twitched with supernatural speed to avoid the missile. The distraction, slight though it was, freed Roran's mind from the sp- soporific influence. Was that magic? He wondered. He dropped his shield, grasped the hammer with both hands, and raised it far above his head, just like Horst did when spreading metal. Roran went up on tiptoe, his entire body bowed backward, then whipped his arms, and with the huh! the hammer cartwheeled through the air and bounced off the Razak shield, leaving a formidable dent. The two attacks were enough to disrupt the last of the Razak's strange power. They clicked rapidly <laughs> to each other as the villagers roared and marched forward. Then the Razak yanked on their reins, wheeling around. Retreat, they growled, riding past the soldiers. The crimson crimson-clad warriors sullenly backed out of Carvajal, stabbing at anyone who came too close. Only then, or only when they were a good distance from the burning wagons did they dare turn their backs. Roran sighed and retrieved his hammer, feeling the bruises on his side and back where he had hit the wall. He bowed his head as he saw that the explosion had killed Par. Nine other men had died. Already wives and mothers rent the night with their wails of grief. How could this happen here? Everyone... Come, called Baldor. Roran blinked and stumbled to the middle of the road where Baldor stood. A Razak sat beetle-like on a horse only twenty yards away. The creature crooked a finger at Rowan and said, You, you smell like your cousin. We never forget a smell. What do you want? he shouted. Why are you here? The Razak chuckled in a horrible, insectile way. <laughs> you. We want information it glanced over its shoulder where its companions had disappeared then cried release Roran and you shall be sold as slaves protect him and we will eat you all we shall have your answer when next we come be sure it is the right one yeah I'd tell them to fuck off like okay really those are great options so now we uh <clears throat> and sign ourselves into enslavement or you eat we, we get eaten. Hmm. Looks like you're, you're going to have a fight, bitch. Also, Roran doesn't even have any information. I know they don't know that, but like he was gone when everything happened. Yeah. You know, what are they going to do? Like, <clears throat> tell us information and he's like so like I wasn't there in Sford doing an apprenticeship fuck and it's fuck like, <laughs> all of this for literally nothing because he doesn't know anything I guess it's better that it happened like this because chances are I don't know I don't know how that could have gone I was gonna say <clears throat> if he would have given himself up to like like give them information. They probably just would have held him as like a bargaining chip. Like yeah. we, we have your brother come and get like, we're going to kill him unless you come to us, Aragon. And then like Aragon probably would have responded to that, you know, like mm-hmm. would have showed himself like come out of hiding. Cause I don't think the Razak would have just been like, Oh, you don't have any information. Okay. Well have a good day. No, definitely not. They would have just fucking killed him. I don't think quite as, killed him they would have like kept him yeah he's better alive than he is dead well the other option if they didn't yeah. do that then they probably just would have like killed everybody and ate everybody because they're fucking creepy but you think it would be like more like more um productive like as galbatorix the mm-hmm. ruler to send out just like men not the razak to just like go question yeah. Because, like, Roran wouldn't have fled then if he probably wouldn't have saw the Razak, like, his father's torturers, if the, like, Empire just would have, like, trudged up and been like, we have questions about Aragon. And Roran's like, I wasn't there and for it. And they're like, hmm, okay. And they like, turned around and was like, have a good day. Blessed be the king in the name of the Empire. And then, like, just walked away and didn't, like, do anything bad and weren't bad people. Mm-hmm. Then, like, then the people of Carvajal have been like, oh, Galbatorix really isn't that bad of a guy, I guess. Yeah, because I feel like on Galbatorix's part, it was kind of <clears throat> stupid to have sent the Razak because, like, they're inherently creepy. Objectively, they are very off-putting 
people. Put or, <laughs> yeah, okay. Listen to my words. Um, they're just inherently, like, awful. Objectively awful. People don't want to talk to them. Like, why send in your head guys? Why not just send in the the grunts? I'm agreeing with you. That's what I was saying. Yeah, like, don't send your fucking lieutenants. It just seems like... Like, what... It's like, what reason was that other than just to put them back into the story? That's what I felt like. No, just to show how fucking shitty they are, I guess. I don't know. I don't understand bringing the Razak. I guess it just shows, like, how... Uh, how uh, delusional Galbatorx is... Yeah. How bad of a ruler he really is. Cause like, we're also speaking from the aspect of like being a good ruler. Well, I'm thinking that cares about its subjects. I'm like th- he really doesn't give a shit about anybody. He's like, I'm a fucking dragon rider. Well, no. So what I'm saying is like, he wants information, right? Don't yeah. send in your scariest troops. Don't send in <clears> the people <throat> that are like inherently terrifying. I think his end goal, like is it information? I think his end goal is to get Aragon. Why the, okay, but like... So, like, the Razak could also just be lying about, we want information. Well, maybe they just want to say they want information, so Ron's like, okay, I'll talk to you. And they're like, ah, sucker, we're going to shack you up, take you back to fucking Uruban, bitch. Well, they probably go to Hellground, because that's where they live. Um, Roran is more likely to say yes to people that aren't the Razak. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like... Not from like a good or bad ruler, but like just a smart ruler. If you want something from somebody, like don't send in the scariest people you've got. I think that's, yeah, it just shows how like delusional Galbatorix is. Yeah. Because I wouldn't say he's a dumb ruler because he obviously overthrew all the other dragon riders somehow. Yeah. I would just say more so that he's just delusional at this point and he thinks that he can just send his little scary Razak everywhere. I mean, like, why would he, like, there's another thing, like, he's, like, so just, like, blinded, I guess, by his own power or something, because, like, why would he send the Razak again? They failed him multiple mm-hmm. times. Like, they're not good at their fucking job. He sent them to retrieve the stone. They didn't retrieve the stone. So then he sent them, or then they were, like, at Hellgrind, and they had them captured, and then they were overthrown by random, like, to Galbatorix until, yeah, like, Galbatorix doesn't know. Maybe, I guess through the Razak's mind, he would know that it was Murtag, you know, Mm -hmm. but a random arrow boy, random archer overthrew them. And then they, they got away. And then it wasn't even the Razak that captured them in Gilead. So like, they've just failed left and right. Yeah. Cause it's like, so now he's like, okay, maybe it's like, okay, Razak last fucking redeeming mission. Go fucking get Roran. Yeah, Go get his brother. Like a couple of kids just like defeated th- some of the most powerful creatures in all the land. You know, mm-hmm. it's like maybe it's like go get fucking roar and then he should be easy. Like, <sighs> like Razak I, fucking suck. More like Raz suck. Because I know they're supposed to be like all powerful, except magic can't use magic well okay right but they're supposed to be super strong and like smart and nimble and like whatever but i'm not seeing it especially at night like the night is when they're the strongest and didn't they like ambush their camp at night that's -hmm. when they should have just fucking like ripped off their shirts and shown these burly ass fucking chests or something and just started pummeling everybody just giant bird chests like the razak at night couldn't overcome it it's making me feel like maybe the razak aren't as big and bad as everyone made them sound. Or maybe they really just are feared. And so like fear is a big factor for a lot of things. So maybe they're just like, wow, they're really scary. We can't defeat them, but they're really not that strong. Let us know in the comment section <laughs> below. What do you guys think of the Razak? They a bunch of Razak, Raz suck fucking babies. Ooh. Are yeah. they, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird how in the first book they're like big bad baddies and then in the second book they're kind of like plot convenience, I guess. Uh, Like right now they're just being plot convenience. Whatever. I'm irritated by that. (laughs) 
Unless there's so something every, you're just not seeing. So everything that's happened in this episode, Aragon is now officially on his way to Ellis Mira. He went in the tunnel. We're actually done with that little portion of Roran. We're going back to Aragon in the next Ooh. episode. Um, yep. Roran is a man. With a hammer. With a hammer. <clears throat> hammer man. And he is Breaking fighting. Everybody's bones. He's fighting now. He's fighting and killing. He's going to fight a girl. He's got a girl with fighting for, you know what I'm saying? Let's get down to business to defeat the, the Razak. No, oh, okay. Did they send me farmers? <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, you know what to do. Hit that like button. Smash the Razak. Oh, sh- I mean, smash that pretty- button like you'd smash the Razak. This way, not this way. Whoa, calm down. <laughs> you just made that like face like. I was just thinking like, I guess they're pretty easy to defeat. You know, I don't know. I could probably fucking take them in the middle. Midday. Give me midday and a hammer. Fuck it. And we'll see you <laughs> in the next one. <laughs> My belly's grumbling. Oh, shit. Did you break it? Oh my god. I am hungry. When are you feeding me? When was the last meal you cooked?